Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in. Today we'll be talking about diffusion, which is a technique for generating new data, typically images. Before we dive into diffusion, I want to briefly motivate it in the context of GANs, which we talked about last week. GANs, or generative adversarial networks, are also a method for generating images, typically in the form of some uh, distribution of images, which matches a data set that you have access to. The idea of GANs is that there is a generator, which takes as input random noise and output something which we want to be close to a real image, and a discriminator, which takes in an image. It could be a real image from our data set or a fake image from the generator. And the discriminator tries to discriminate or tell the difference between the fake and the real images. By training both of these together simultaneously, we saw that we could achieve remarkable performance fairly quickly. As the discriminator is able to tell apart real and fake images, the generator learns to fool the discriminator. And we do this by carefully chosen loss functions and backpropagation. As we discussed last time, one issue with GANs is that they suffer from mode collapse. Mode collapse is when a generator learns to output only a single image, but that image is very realistic. It could perhaps even be from the real data set. In that case, the discriminator takes in this realistic image and has no choice but to say that it's real, and the training process stops. While we are getting a realistic image, it's not very interesting for us because we're only getting one image. There are ways to deal with this, such as by using specialized loss functions, such as based on Wasserstein loss, or attempting to regularize the model to force it to use the randomness of its input in the generator. But in general, we don't know how to solve these problems uh, at scale, especially when we train larger and larger models. In lieu of GANs, the deep learning community has recently turned to diffusion as an alternate way of generating images. And while it requires more computational capabilities, as we'll see today, it has been remarkably effective when you have large enough models that are trained for long enough on enough data. Okay, so let's jump into diffusion. Diffusion is a technique, as we said, for generating new images. In the diffusion process, we also start with random noise, but here this random noise is in the shape of the image that we want to end up with. So for example, it could be what we see here depicted on the far left. At each step of the process, we're going to apply a model to this image, which will take in the image's input and output noise. In particular, it'll be the noise that it thinks was applied to this image. Um, and then we'll take the output of that model and subtract it from the true noise. And we'll do this repeatedly. So I look at this image, I say, OK, what do I think in this image is noisy? I remove that noise. And as I keep going, the hope is that eventually a very realistic image will emerge. In this case, we started with nothing but a bunch of random noise. And by ostensibly doing this diffusion process, we ended up with a lovely picture of a cat uh, sitting on a bike. <laughs> now, this is a ostensibly difficult task. How does the model know what noise to remove at each step? And in particular, how do we get training data for this task? The key observation of diffusion is that if we think about going from noise to an image, that seems very difficult. But if we just flip this around and think about going from an image to noise, that's very easy. We can start with any image that we have access to. And then we add noise to it again and again and again until we get to an image which is completely noisy and is unrecognizable. Uh, so that's the way that we get training data. The idea is that we will pass in this image as input to the model. And the noise that was applied to this image to get that image is the thing that we're going to try to learn. Uh, and then we just apply our regular loss techniques. And in this way, we attempt to train a model, which is able to go from uh, a noisy image to a less noisy image by learning what noise was applied to it. And that's how we train. Uh, let's formulize this with a three-step recipe. The model is an architecture that takes in a noisy image and predicts what noise was applied. The loss function is typically the L2 norm difference between the predicted noise and the actual noise. This is something that we can actually get because we were the ones who generated the noise to add it to the image that we're using as input. And we also have an optimizer. As usual, we run gradient descent on the parameter space of the model to minimize this loss so that it learns what noise was applied to each one of these images. Um, this lab will have two parts. 
The first part will be on the MNIST data set. So it'll be very similar to the task we performed last week with GANs, where, uh, where we take in, where we're attempting to generate digits, uh, handwritten digits from the MNIST data set. Okay, so let's jump in with diffusion on MNIST. The MNIST data set, as we know, consists of 28 by 28 black and white images with handwritten digits on them. Uh, we will be passing these in as batches to our loss function. Uh, here we just create our data loader as we've done before. In this case, we will just simply visualize what's in the data set. Um, as you can see, these look like handwritten digits. You may mistake this for an S, but really it's a five. And we also have access to the labels. So we get these images and the shape of the images should be uh, 96 <laughs> by one by 28 by 20. I guess maybe this is, oh, right, okay. So I already ran the training process and there is some batch at the end which doesn't have enough left for 512. So this is just the remaining number of images at that point. If we redefine images and labels here, and then we run this code again, it should be 512 by one by 28 by 28. So there are 20, 512 images here. Uh, as, promised, uh, as promised, <laughs> we have handwritten digits. And I also checked the shape down here. Okay, so the first step of the diffusion process is to generate the training data. In our case, this is quite easy because we simply load an image and then we're gonna add noise to it again and again. Here, the noise that we're gonna add is drawn from a Gaussian, a normal distribution with standard deviation sigma, and we can choose the sigma parameter that we're going to set. In this case, we chose 0.35. The reason why is that because we, we want to start with an image that looks like this, and then we want to gradually change it so that it becomes more and more difficult to see that there's a five here until we get to the very end and it looks like random noise. By training in this way, uh, we will hopefully at inference time have a model that works quite well because it will start back here with random noise. It'll gradually subtract off noise again and again until an image actually appears. Um, and we want that image to, at the very end, be recognizable to us as a five. Of course, this is very difficult to make the leap from here to here because there's absolutely no noise in this image than there is noise here. So it's it'll be unlikely that we get a result that looks like this, but we're hoping for something that looks like uh, an image along these lines. Okay. Of course, there are lots of hyperparameter pairs that you can choose. For example, you can choose sign equals 0.2. In which case, uh, it's a more gradual process and the five is more recognizable as we go. But even in the very last image in this case, you can kind of see that this is a five. Like if you squint at it properly, you'll see that this looks like a five. So maybe it's possible that we just won't, um, the model won't know what to do when it's actually given actual noise in this case. So we set it to 0.35, but this is something that you're welcome to play around with. Okay. Uh, training and diffusion model is particularly finicky, sorry, finicky. To make this model work, there are several hacks that we used. The first of them is that the output of the diffusion model is normalized to have mean zeroed and standard deviation sigma. Uh, that, that means that the output that we're getting more closely, to, uh, more closely resembles the actual noise that we know we're going to predict. In addition, the model takes in the number of noise steps that have been applied to the image. The idea being that if we're denoising here, that's different from denoising here, that's different from denoising here. So we're passing in signed information to the model, which we hope will make it easier. And finally, we also give it even more signed information by giving the model the label of the image. If I know this is a five, then I will denoise it in a different way than if I know this is a zero, for example. With all of this different side information that we're passing in uh, and this normalization step, we were able to get this to work, but I struggled finding an architecture. In particular, if I removed any one of these things, I had difficulty making this training process succeed. Okay, uh, so with all these things in mind, let's begin by writing some code. We'll define the normalization function. This will take in x and the sigma parameter, which is the magnitude of the, no the variance of the noise that we're adding. Sorry, actually, the standard deviation of the noise that we're adding. Um, and here, all we're doing is we're going to mean normalize x and uh, divide by the standard deviation. So at this point, it has uh, standard deviation 1, but we're going to multiply by sigma, so it, it's standard deviation, or the variance will be sigma squared. Okay? Uh, we're now 
ready to define the architecture. The diffuser will consist of only two layers. We could make this larger if we wanted to, and you're welcome to play around with it. But for the purposes of our case, we actually don't really need it to already get some interesting results. Uh, we'll start off by, uh, our, we'll have a linear layer. We'll have two linear layers and a ReLU activation in between them. The linear layer will go from the size of the input, which remember consists of the image. We're going to specify the number of steps that we're passing in, and then also the number of classes corresponding to what's actually in this image. And then we will uh, go from this dimension to 28 by 28, and then again from 28 by 28 to 28 by 28. The reason being that we want to output uh, noise, which is the same size as the image, because then we can directly interpret this as pixel noise, and then we can just subtract them from the image. At the forward pass, we reshape our image to be the correct size. We encode the amount of noise that we've applied so far. So this is from zero to 20 in our case. Uh, we'll put this into a uh, one hot encoding, and we'll do the same thing for the labels. We did this last time when we were creating conditional GANs. And then we'll concatenate all of these together, pass it through our neural network, and then normalize at the end. OK, now that we have our model in hand, we are ready to initialize the model, the optimizer, and the criterion. We're going to put all of this on the CUDA. Today, that's very necessary. We really need to use a GPU. Otherwise, this will take an insanely long amount of time, especially the second part of what we're going to describe today. Uh, we'll initialize all of this. We'll create an optimizer and we'll use um, mean squared error loss, which will be uh, the, it'll be the difference between the actual noise that we applied and the predicted noise. We're also creating this normal distribution, which is on the GPU so that we can sample from it efficiently. And we'll have this handy function, which will give us an evaluation, or it will help us evaluate the model. Uh, at this point, we take a known, uh, or to, for this evaluation, we create some noisy images from our normal distribution. Uh, we'll generate labels for each one of these. So this will have labels 0, 1, 2, 3, et cetera. And then for each one of the uh, steps where we want to remove noise from it, we're going to uh, decrease the amount of noise level that we have. And then um, so this will specify at the end, it will say that we've applied noise steps to it. And at the beginning, uh, we should have applied zero steps of noise. We will pass this noise the image through the model and get out some noise predicted, and then we'll subtract it from it. So this is the inference phase of that. And then for each one of these, we'll plot them on this handy, uh, we'll, we'll plot them and visualize what we get. Of course, because this model isn't trained, Right now, we're getting something that's actually uh, completely meaningless. But during the training process, hopefully, it will improve this. We'll train for 25 epics. Uh, and the process is quite similar to the valuation stage. We'll get the less noisy version of the image by sampling an image and then a unit normal distribution multiplied by the square root of the noise level so far. This is the same thing as iteratively adding the noise level uh, again and again, but we're going to do it all in one fell swoop so that each one of these training steps is independent of the other ones. We'll add uh, one step of noise here. We'll have a more noisy version, which is this less noisy version plus this noise. And then the input to this model will be the more noisy version, the noise level that we have so far, and the labels. And then the loss will be the output and the actual noise that we added to get there. Uh, and then we back propagate through as we normally do. As you can see, initially, it doesn't really look like anything's going on, but quickly something is happening. There's something going on here where we, we get some output. It looks like we're generating eights at this step. Uh, as we go on, it looks like maybe we learned it less, but now here we're generating something different from each one of them. So the model has learned to pick up on the label of what is actually in the image. It looks kind of clear that this is a zero and this is a one and this is a three. Uh, and as we, trained for longer and longer. <laughs> Something weird is happening here. Uh, it looks like we're getting more and more recognizable images. So I can see this is a zero, one, two, three. Maybe I know it's a four, but it kind of looks like a four or five, six, and then an eight. Uh, as we train for even longer, we get more and more recognizable images. Of course, notice that we're not going to get anything that's as perfect as the actual image that we started with, because it's very hard to go. Let me scroll up. 
uh, from the leap from the actual starting image to this. That's a very hard task. So the majority of what we'll see is probably at best of the quality of this image. And the final training step, where maybe we're seeing something around here, here, which is still quite impressive um, given the, the amount of training that we've done on so far, which really isn't that much. These models typically need lots and lots of training to perform quite well. Okay, so we've seen this training process in practice for a particular type of diffusion model. Of course, you could rightly be quite over underwhelmed by this because you can look at this and say, okay, like it hasn't done particularly well. Um, that's quite disappointing. I was hoping for more, especially because last time when we did this with GANs, we got images that were quite realistic. The reason why is that doing this successfully takes lots and lots of compute and data and training, and we just don't have access to it uh, in this case to, to do this training by ourselves from, from uh, by hand. In context, we could train GANs relatively well, except the problem is when we throw lots of compute at them, they suffer from mode flaps. So what you can do instead is if you have lots of compute, you can pre-train or you can train these huge models and we won't be able to train them ourselves, but we can look at pre-trained ones of them. And in particular, we're going to look at the stable diffusion process. Uh, and I'll describe, describe this at a high level first. Uh, and the, the key to it, CLIP, is something that we're gonna talk about next week, but for now, I'll just describe the way it works. Okay, so uh, what is stable diffusion? It's a method. For, so in our case, the thing we just did is we trained a model where instead of passing an image and a text description, we passed in a picture of a digit and a label for that. And then we did this training process uh, where we, we didn't do any encoding, but we took noisy images, or we took images and we added noise to them. And then we trained this process by going from the no more noisy image to the less noisy image. Similarly, without a lot of the fanciness going on at inference time, we generated random noise. We used our diffusion model to go from the more noisy to the less noisy image, and then we just looked at the final result. There are two key differences here between what we did and the stable diffusion process. The first is in the stable diffusion process, we want to have, uh, instead of a label, one hot encoded label and an image of a digit, we're going to be using more interesting images with more interesting text description. So this data will be different. The challenge, of course, at this point is that as the size of this data and the size of this text gets quite large, we'll need a very large model to do this diffusion process. Quite cleverly, uh, the idea or the, one of the insights of stable diffusion is that we can embed both of these into the same dimension. So instead of working in, as we did, like a 28 by 28 space dimension and then conditioning on a text label, we will embed both of these things into some much smaller dimension, which hopefully captures the semantic meaning of the text and the meaning of the image that we have access to. And to do that, we're going to be using a pre-trained text encoder and a pre-trained image encoder. Once we get them down into the small initial space, then we'll do the same diffusion process that we did before, except in this, uh, in this latent space that we don't have any understanding of. So if we actually try to look at one of these things in the small latent space where it's doing this training process, we wouldn't understand what's going on. But if we have an image decoder, then we can run this process, conditioning on some kind of text prompt at the beginning, we get to the end and we wouldn't be able to interpret what this is, but we can decode it and hopefully we'll get an image in the pixel space that we understand, which is meaningful to us. Now, there are many moving pieces to this. We will use pre-trained text encoders, image encoders, and image decoders. The way we train these is with clip, which we'll talk about next time. Um, and this is a like, huge model, even in this small diffusion space. So. There are lots of things here which we can't directly, uh, we won't be able to train ourselves, but we'll use pre-trained versions of them. Um, and I recommend reading these notes, which you can find at this URL for a course I taught on deep learning, uh, which described this process in more detail. Okay, but uh, let's jump in with the cool stuff. Uh, so stable diffusion, as we said, is a technique for generating images from text prompts. Uh, there are, two components that we will add to this. One of them is that we have a two, yeah, so before we used a very small model 
But in reality, if we tried to do this for an even reasonably sized image, that would be ridiculous. It would be like in the hundreds of billions of parameters. Clearly, we need to do something smarter. The something smarter that we're doing is we're encoding the images and the text into the small latent space, and then that's where we're training a diffusion model. When we want to look at the images, we'll decode the images from the latent space to the pixel space that we understand. Uh, it seems quite difficult to connect the diffusion process to a text prompt, but we're going to be able to condition on it um, by using a an embedding of the text that we saw before uh, using clip. Okay. At a high level, I think this is quite good. I like to think about, oops, sorry. I like to think of stable diffusion as looking for objects in clouds. If your friend points to a cloud and says, hey, doesn't that look like a turtle? The cloud slowly morphs into a turtle right before your eye. Stable diffusion is quite similar. We tell the model that hidden in the random noise is a turtle. And sure enough, the model removes the noise until the resulting image is in fact a turtle. Okay, so the thing we're gonna be doing today is just evaluation and inference, no training whatsoever. But even then, uh, we're working with a ridiculous number of parameters, more than a billion of them. So it's a minor miracle that we can run this at all on the free GPUs that pr are provided by Plaid. Uh, this process will take under a minute to run this code. The evaluation step, if we're not using a GPU, GPU can take an hour instead of under a minute. So GPUs are very important and helpful for us. Uh, to do this, I'll install some of these custom libraries. Oh. Okay, hopefully that's fine. Um, we will have different tokens. This is my token. You should get your own, and then you can have access to Hugging Face. I guess that was pretty funny of me to give access to this, but I haven't run into any problems yet, so <laughs> use it wisely, please. Um, there are several parts to this. The first one is the autoencoder, which will encode and decode the images and decode the Right, the autoencoder, which will encode and decode the images to and from this latent space. The second, second thing we have is a tokenizer, uh, which converts the regular language sentence we have to indices, which are then encoded to the text encoder. This is a similar process to what we described before with the word embedding um, demo that is also available on YouTube, and you can also find access to in the uh, Python notebook repository. And then we also have a, the architecture for actually doing the diffusion itself. One of the innovations which people believe has made stable diffusion so effective is that we're using a very large architecture called the UNet, which is um, quite helpful. It's basically a convolutional network, which goes from a larger representation to a smaller representation back up to a larger representation. The idea being that at this point, we're hopefully capturing some inherent understanding of what's in the image but then also we want access to all the features we had before. So there are these residual connections. We talked about previously how residual connections make the loss function more smooth and easier to optimize. And we're taking that advantage, taking advantage of that property again here in this unit architecture. Okay, so these are the th three things that we're gonna uh, load. We have this autoencoder, the tokenizer, the text encoder, and this unit. All of these are very large uh, and we can look at the number of parameters in each one of them. Variational autoencoder has 83 million parameters. The text encoder has 123. And the unit has 859 million parameters. So together, this is well over a billion parameters, which is uh, very, very substantial. Is it well over? It might not be well over. Very close, about a billion. Okay, so here's the fun part. We're gonna choose a text prompt of your choice and you can make it be whatever you want it to be. I chose airplane in the style of Van Gogh and maybe we can change this in a little bit. Uh, we will have this scheduler, which we'll use in this training process. Uh, we'll need the scheduler for keeping the values in the latent space stable. I'm not really sure how this works. Oh, I think this is like the schedules, the uh, learning rate. This time. I'm not sure. I should know this. We also, we're going to start with these latent values, which will be in the random values, which will be in the latent space. Uh, and then we will uh, decode that, or we'll apply the diffusion to, the, to each one of these and hopefully get something that's understandable. We'll have 
two text prompts. One of them will be a conditional prompt, which takes in the text input that we had uh, and applies a tokenizer to it and then embeds it. The other thing that we're going to have is an unconditional prompt, which will not have any text description in it, and we'll just let the model diffuse as it wants to. We will combine both of these together. Um, and we'll use both of them in this training or in this uh, evaluation step. For each one of the steps here, we are going to take our latent model representation, make two copies of this. One we'll have for the conditional prompt with our text prompt and one with the unconditional prompt. We will scale these uh, so it's an appropriate input to the model and then we'll pass it through our unit. We'll specify the number of steps that we're applying it for and then the text embeddings here. And then we're gonna get out two outputs, the noise prediction from the unconditional and the noise prediction from this text description. And then we're going to trade off between them. So the actual noise that we're predicting is some combination of what we thought from the unconditional part and some from the conditional part. Um, this is an artifact of the demo that I got this particular part from, but it makes it work. And it enables us to like have some trade off between just doing the noise prediction based on what's in the text and also a noise prediction based on what appears to be in the image. Uh, then we'll update this latent variable by stepping through it with these latents and we'll subtract off this noise prediction from it basically. Okay, uh, now that we've done this, all of these noise, all of these things, all of these latents that we've saved and we're putting in this, uh, this array are in a small latent space that we don't understand. So for example, if I look at the latent, uh, the shape of this latent, it's one by four by 64 by 64. I can look at just one of these, uh, sorry, maybe I should do this. The shape of this should be 64 by 64. I can attempt to plot it, uh, but it'll be completely meaningless to us because it's in the small latent space. Yeah. Uh, dot. Yeah. Okay. Oh, actually, I haven't done this before. Oh, that's cool. Okay, so it's in the small latent space, and maybe it's kind of interpretable to us. Uh, we can also look at the second one of these. That's actually very cool. So, oh my god, that's awesome. So it looks like we kind of are seeing a bit of an airplane and different representations here, but nonetheless. I wouldn't look at this and be particularly amazed that it gives us an actual airplane. Okay, so uh, we'll go from the small latent space, which really can't capture the complexity of the full image that we want to see. We will decode it with a variational autoencoder. Uh, we'll do this operation to like make the values into a reasonable range. Uh, and then we will plot this. Uh, if we plot the final product, it's actually gorgeous. It's this like wonderful airplane, which is arguably in the style of Van Gogh. And we can watch, watch this run. Here, these are each one of the images at the different components of the latent process. And you can see that while well, it started off being something that was like, and this is noise, as we do the diffusion process and we take each one of these latent representations and decode them, we get something that's a beautiful as an output. Uh, for fun, we can, I would highly suggest playing around with different um, text prompts here. You can specify it here. Okay, so maybe a lecture on deep learning. <laughs> and then if I run everything after this point, uh, this process takes some time, although it's very fast. Here, we're actually doing the diffusion process. Uh, and it looks like we're doing 100 steps of it. And then we're taking each one of the things we had and we're decoding that image into a space that we can understand. And then this code will just take all those images, put them together, and we'll get a nice movie out of them. OK. And. Let's see what the diffusion process have given us. 
<laughs> now, this is a little bit of a very disturbing image of a person. I think some models that are not ridiculously trained really struggle with human faces. So his eyes are honestly very disturbing. Interestingly, this model even has kind of an understanding of deep learning. So this looks like there's some kind of video screen and it, it thinks that deep is spelled D-E-P and then learning is spelled something like L-E-E. -E. If you look carefully at this, this is very disturbing, especially his fingers, but you would say that this model is probably understood at some, in some way, in some sense, what it means to give a lecture on deep learning. There's someone at the front talking uh, and there's something on a screen or a board describing the topic that is being uh, lectured about. So I think this is very impressive. I'd recommend playing around with inanimate objects. I think it gives you the best result. So we could do something like a dark magical forest with a brilliant mushroom. See what happens. <laughs> The funny part is that this has been ridiculously optimized by someone else, and this was just code I wrote to uh, decode the image. So ironically, this is the bottleneck and the time complexity of <laughs> removing it. Um, it looks like it's primarily stuck on moving this to from the GPU to the CPU so we can digitalize it. OK, let's do this again. Remember, it was a dark forest, magical forest with a brilliant mushroom. Something's appearing. Ooh, that's beautiful. It is a dark forest. And maybe these are mushrooms, which do look quite magical because they're taking the place of trees and they're a little bit purple. So I like I've gotten so much entertainment from playing around with this, and I can only recommend that you do this as well. Um, thanks for tuning in and listening to both parts of the demo this week. As always, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me or post them on the discussion format.